Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in this morning. I hope you're enjoying our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power. More than that, I hope you're learning from it. Right now, we're talking about the Emperor Constantine and what role he played in the establishment of the Bishop of Rome, the so-called Vicar of Christ on Earth, as the foundation for the claimed right of the Pope, the divine right to rule the world both in spirituals and in temporals. The so-called Vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on Earth, that somehow the Bishop of Rome ascended in importance to the role of Bishop of Bishops. It's all a fabrication by the Roman Catholic Church, and it is the, one of the greatest deception the world has ever seen. The rise of Antichrist, this is what we're talking about. Now, back to Constantine. Yesterday we were talking about this unholy alliance that was created early on between Constantine and the Bishop of Rome, or the priests of the Roman Catholic Church, to overthrow Maxentius, the legal ruler of the Roman Empire. And the ingratiation that Constantine leveled upon the priesthood of the Roman Church for their part in the rebellion, and to help him overthrow that Maxentius government. We're going to talk more about Constantine today and this foundation built upon shifting sand that now forms the basis for the Pope's blasphemous claims of being God's vicar on earth. The, the author continues now, if you're, if you're following along, I'm going to back up one paragraph for continuity purposes this morning. We begin reading the first full paragraph on page 286 if you're following along. It says, thus established in Rome, Constantine entered immediately upon a system of measures by means of which the clergy, the Roman Catholic clergy, were greatly advanced as a reward for their support of his cause, that is, the overthrow of Maxentius. He conferred great uh, favors upon them, such as they had never before enjoyed. Those already corrupted by the prevailing disorders of which Eusebius speaks were beyond all doubt quite ready to accept this arrangement without any inquiry beyond the mere question of personal benefit to themselves. And as these had the control of the, of the uh, church at Rome, it soon resulted in uniting the Roman church and the state together in such a way as to make one dependent on the other. Even then he had not become a Christian by uniting with the church, nor did he do so for a number of years after the Council of Nice. Yet he convened that council, was present during its sessions, participated in its deliberations, and dictated its decisions. It is a gross perversion of history to call him a Christian emperor, in the sense that the papists continually do. For none of the fathers from whom we derive information of those times gives any account of his baptism into the Roman church until he was about to die, long after his capture of Rome. Socrates says that in the 65th year of his age, he received, quote-unquote, Christian baptism in Nicomedia and died in a few days. Sozomen says the same thing, adding that it was in the 35th year of his reign. And so does Theodoret, and also Eusebius. Eusebius talks about God having frequently manifested himself to him, and everybody is familiar with this story about the sign of the cross in the heavens, and it is undoubtedly true that he had great respect for Christianity. But all this does not go to show, against other acknowledged facts, that he had become so connected with the Church of Rome as to be moved by motives of piety alone to bestow so many royal favors upon it. The fact is, 
he never united with the Church of Rome at all. When baptized in Nicomedia, the ceremony was performed by Arian bishops and by an Arian church. Remember, the Arians were regarded as heretics. I'll just add, and it says, so that he never was, according to the teachings of the Roman church, an Orthodox Christian, but died, as he had lived, a heretic. When he allied himself, therefore, with the clergy at Rome, that act must, of necessity, be referred to some other motive than the service of God or the special advancement of Christianity. There could have been no other than a temporal motive, that of securing and retaining possession of the imperial crown. And it is equally conclusive also that the clergy of Rome had no other than a temporal motive in forming so close an intimate alliance with a prince who had not demonstrated his devotion to Christianity by uniting with their church, which we are now told by those who profess to be their successors is the only passport to heaven. Thus, the union formed under these circumstances and by these contracting parties between the church and the state was on the part of both, a mere scheme of ambition, designed for no other purpose than to acquire power. If Christianity had anything to do with it, it was of secondary consideration. Understanding perfectly well the wishes of such of the clergy as had brought the church into the condition described by Eusebius, in other words, utter chaos, and how they were to be kept faithful to him, one of the first steps of Constantine was to issue an edict commanding large sums of money to be paid to, quote-unquote, certain ministers. In other words, he's buying them off. They remain loyal to him because he's buying them off. And it says he exempt. this is more benefits, listen to this, he said he exempted the clergy from public service. He placed the Christians, quote, in almost all the principal posts of the Roman government. And you better believe there is a perfect explanation right here why Roman Catholics serve in the highest positions in our government here in the United States today. He further decreed that part of the funds levied from tributary countries should be sent, quote, to the bishops and clergy. In other words, the other nations that, that formed the, the, the Roman Empire paid taxes, and those taxes went to the bishops and the clergy of the Roman Church. In other words, it was a state-sponsored religion, and that's precisely what they're trying to do in this country today. That's precisely what they do do, and if you were careful to listen to our book by uh, Lorraine Bettner, Roman Catholicism, and also the book Vickers of Christ, The Dark Side of the Papacy by Peter DeRosa, and so many other books that we've read here on Inquisition Update. Rome's defining characteristic is to proclaim for itself to be the state-sponsored religion and to get the governments of the world to sponsor the church financially. And nowhere is that better demonstrated Right here in the United of America, tax exemption, we have public lands being given to the church for pennies on the dollar, and then those, those uh, bequests of land and buildings and property is turned into revenue-generating taxes that pay no taxes that fit the Roman Catholic Church. We have a state-sponsored church in this country, but everybody's afraid to talk about it except certain very, very important authors that we've read right here on the Inquisition Update. And he further enacted a law <clears throat> giving immunity to the clergy in reference to taxation. There's, the, there's more addition to the state-sponsored church, the state-financed church. And it says, also another permitting appeals for the secular courts to the bishop. Another permitting appeals, excuse me, 
another another uh, piece of legislation permitting appeals from the secular courts to the bishops. In other words, they were exempt from the from the the, the uh, uh, temporal laws. They were exempt from civil prosecution, and we see that in the in the global pedophile priest pandemic in the world. The priests cannot be held accountable for these crimes, and only the ones only the only ones who are convicted and caused to serve any civil time in prison are those simply that the that the papacy has to relinquish to the civil power just to save face in this country. But the vast majority of pedophile priests are protected, not just by the Roman Catholic Church, but by the governments of the nations and where these Roman Catholic pedophile priests dwell. It's a state-sponsored church. Rome demands it. And under the concordats that are signed by the Vatican amongst the various nations of the world, this is what is established, a state-sponsored church. What other church writes a formal contract between the state and the church. Only the Roman Catholic Church does this. And here's the foundation for it, right here during the reign of Constantine and how he curted, uh, how he benefited the Roman Catholic Church and only to secure control of the empire. And the, and, the, and the priests of the Roman Catholic Church were very grateful to have this help because it increased their power and influence. It was an unholy alliance, and it is the very basis upon which the Roman cult is built. It says, He provided for the first time that persons should be allowed to leave their property to the church by will. See how many efforts Constantine made to enrich the Roman church? And it says, who could doubt the result of such unbounded favoritism as this? It soon raised the church of Rome to an unparalleled condition of grandeur. And that's what we see in the Roman church all over the world, especially here in the United States. The clergy became a privileged class sheltered and protection as they thus were by the emperor. It's the emperor who shelters the priests. And it says, when the emperor was gone, for he remained there but a little while, they did as they pleased. The Roman Catholic priests did as they pleased, for everybody understood the terrible vengeance in store for those who resisted terrible vengeance that is in store for anybody who resists the power of these Roman Catholic priests. And that's why they run roughshod all over Washington, D.C., all over the Supreme Court, all over the, the Congress, both the House and the Senate, because everybody's scared to death of what hell they will unleash upon them if they come forward with how much influence these Roman Catholic priests have in Washington, D.C. Everybody's afraid of them. Everybody in Washington, D.C. is afraid of them. So it's up to us. It's up to us little people to identify this Roman crisis in Washington, D.C. and condemn it, expose it, and demand that our government respond to our grievances. I'm not Roman Catholic. I'm Protestant. And I demand religious liberty. I demand freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom to worship God according to the dictates of the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures and my conscience. I am not Roman Catholic. I will never be Roman Catholic, and I will never kowtow to a Roman Catholic government. And our government is running roughshod over our rights because of these Jesuit and Roman Catholic hierarchical priests in Washington who are trying to conform the United States to that old order of things that was destroyed after the Protestant Reformation. The new world order is just the old world order restored, and it's time for the American people to recognize this cabal for what it is. I'm not afraid to speak out against the Roman Catholic Church. 
I'm not afraid to speak out against the papacy and his Roman Catholic hierarchy that run roughshod over our Constitution, that run roughshod over Christ, that run roughshod over his scriptures, and that make us all slaves bond slaves to a government that kowtows to the Pope and not to Christ or the people of the United States. It's time for the American people to wake up. History is repeating itself, and we're reading the foundation of this new world order right here in this book by R.W. Thompson, The Papacy and the Civil Power. I reiterate to my listeners, it is so important that you get a copy of this book and you read it and research it for yourself. And I'm sure that if you do, with an unbiased mind, with faith in Christ, and a workable knowledge of history and the Bible, you'll come to the same conclusions. And you'll recognize the machinations that are taking place in Washington, both from the Democratic and the Republican parties, and all the candidates running for high political office in this country, especially the President of the United States, are controlled by these priests of Rome who they fear. Fear controls these people. And whenever you see fear controlling an individual, it's time to walk away. He cannot be trusted. That's our government. That's our government. Who in Washington has the courage to stand up and name these priests as having run the agenda, the political and religious agenda in this country for centuries. I haven't heard any. And I dare say we won't hear any. It's up to us. And we have people like R.W. Thompson to trust, because he's given us true history here. He says, when the emperor was gone, for he remained there but a little while, the Roman Catholic priests did as they pleased, for everybody understood the terrible vengeance in store for those who resisted. The compact was faithfully executed by both parties to the temporal profit of both. The men of that day are not supposed to have been materially different from those of the present times. Hence the splendor and magnificence introduced into the Roman Church led to such departures from the simple modes of apostolic worship as were supposed to be necessary to arrest the attention of the pagan part of the population and to attract them to that church. Much of this splendor, and we talked about this repeatedly, the so-called splendor of the Roman Catholic Church that draws people to it like a siren, much of this splendor was, in fact, borrowed from the pagan worship. Remember what, what Lorraine Bettner said in his book? He quoted the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia. So did Peter DeRosa, quoting the Encyclopedia of the Roman Catholic Church, admitting that much of the splendor and pomp and circumstance and vestments and rituals of the Roman Catholic Church comes straight from paganism. Rome doesn't even deny it. He said much of this splendor, this, this gold-plated splendor that so attracts people to the Roman Catholic Church, in fact, is borrowed from the pagan worship, while much of it originated in the pride and vanity of the clergy. Oh, they're so mystical. They're so holier than thou, wearing these elaborate jewel-encrusted vestments. Oh, they must be holy. Surely they must be holy, right? And the whole world wanders after the beast. That's all it takes to impress a pagan, is to put them in a pagan environment where Christ does not rule, but the ambitions of men and a lot of hocus-pocus and a lot of pomp and circumstances, holy water, incense, yada, yada, yada. It draws them in like flies, and they love it so much they'll do anything they can to sustain it and to improve its power all over the world. Better that they drop all of that and get a King James Bible and read it for themselves and learn about Christ and His humility 
and instantly they'll recognize the phony, glossed-over facade of Roman Catholicism, and they'll could, they can admit to themselves what a what a gory, gaudy contrivance that it is. It should not surprise us now to know that in the midst of such a state of things as this, the bishops struggled with each other for the ascendancy, as Eusebius tells us, while at the same time they were thoroughly united in the wish and purpose to make the Roman church the quote-unquote mistress and ruler of all the other churches. Certainly, there is no example of such struggles and contentions found in the lives of the apostles. No question about personal or official supremacy. Paul rebuked Peter at Antioch for his course toward the Jews. Excuse me. Paul rebuked Peter at Antioch for his course toward the Jews, but no controversy about authority grew out of it. And Cyprian, one of the great fathers of the third century, strongly condemned anything of the kind. In these express words, he said, quote, For none of us ought to make himself a bishop of bishops, or pretend to owe, his, uh, excuse me, or pretend to awe his brethren by a tyrannical fear, because every bishop is at liberty to do as he pleases, and can no more be judged by another then he can judge others himself, unquote. Now, that's an important quote. Let me read it again and really sink your mind into it and let it communicate with you. Listen to what this man says. For none of us ought to make himself a bishop of bishops. Is that not what the Roman Catholic Pope calls himself, bishop of bishops, supreme pontiff? This is Antichrist identified. In plain language, and neither should we pretend to awe our brethren by tyrannical fear. This is another definition of Antichrist, another definition of the papacy, who has wreaked fear in the hearts of God's people forever. For from its very inception, we just spoke of this fear that is expressed by the, the governments of the world, they're fearful of the repercussions that can be brought to bear against them if they oppose this Roman Catholic hierarchy. Tyrannical fear. And he says further, because every bishop is at liberty to do as he pleases and can no more be judged by another than he can judge others himself. And what does the Pope of Rome do? He judges every man, and no man may judge him. Another definition of Antichrist. Pretending to be Christ himself on the earth. It's just too easy. The math is just too easy. And yet I find one of the most difficult jobs of my ministry is to convince people that the Pope is the biblical and historical Antichrist. Nobody fulfills the prophecies of God in the Bible regarding Antichrist more than the papacy. And the world has had 2,000 years nearly to identify him, and yet they still look in the future for Antichrist. The blindness can be cut with a knife. The Roman Catholic Church styles itself as the divine right corrector of heresy. That the Roman Catholic Church is the only church of Jesus Christ, and it is to rid the world of heresy. And this justification, and this is what they use as justification for the Holy Roman Inquisition that claimed the, the, the hundreds of thousands of lives throughout history. All in the name of putting down heresy. Well, one of the first heresies to plague God's church, so-called, was the Arian heresy. And we're going to learn a little bit about it and what role 
the Bishop of Rome, the so-called Vicar of Christ on Earth, had to do with it and what role the papacy played in it, if any. You're going to find this very, very interesting because the Roman Catholic Church justifies its role as the, the heretical cops of the world based on what took place during the Arian heresy and the Council of Nice that was, that was convened to, to deal with this heresy. We're going to find out some things that the Roman Catholic Church doesn't tell. It says, It is more than probable that the controversy about Arianism, which did so much to retard the progress of Christianity, grew out of the pride and vanity of the original contestants, Alexander, Bishop of Alexandria, and Arius, one of his presbyters. Such was the opinion of Constantine. He, quote, wrote to rebuke them, unquote, for having originated a disturbance, quote, of a truly insignificant character and quite unworthy of such fierce contention, unquote. He cared nothing about the point of doctrine involved, whether the Son was of the same or the like substance of the Father, or whether the three persons in the so-called Trinity were equal or not. The probability is that he had no well-defined views about it. At all events, his chief complaint was that they had, quote, made a controversy public, which it was in their power to have concealed, unquote, also, that it was, quote, the disputatious caviling of ill-employed leisure. In other words, they had too much time on their hands and were causing trouble. And was, quote, rather consistent with puerile thoughtlessness than suitable to the intelligence of priests and prudent men, unquote. But this useless controversy on account of the virulence and malignity with which it was carried on by the bishops and clergy of both sides led to the Council of Nice in 325 A.D., the first ecumenical council, so-called. The Christian world had not got along well enough, uh, excuse me, the Christian world had got along well enough for nearly 300 years without any such assemblage. Innumerable heresies had sprung up between the planting of the church at Jerusalem at that and that time, and the influence of the greater part of them, if not nearly all, had been dispelled by the love and charity which the apostolic fathers and their immediate descendants reflected in their lives and example. To none of them had occurred the idea of an external church organization with powers of compulsion, or with powers of persecution, or with powers of holy Roman inquisition, he's trying to say. And it says, and yet, the Council of Nice, in one respect, was one of the most important assemblages ever held, in this, that it placed the Christian sentiment of the apostolic age in the formula of a creed, which, if it had never been disturbed, would at all times have furnished, as it would yet furnish, the common ground of Christian union throughout the world. This, however, is to be attributed mainly to the fact that the purity of Christian life and church government had been preserved in the ancient churches, whose influence dictated all the fundamentals of the Nicene Creed, so that the result was in no sense aggressive, but simply responsive to the existing Christian sentiment of the age. In another respect, the cause of true Christianity would have fared better if it never had been held, or if, it, or if held, it had grown out of other causes and had been controlled in some of its aspects by other influences. We find demonstration of this in the fact that the papal writers yet refer to it in proof of the supremacy and infallibility of the Pope and of the Roman Church, whereas, apart from the causes which led to it and the external influences brought to bear upon it, that is, insofar as it concerns the Christian faith, it proves neither. 
but the reverse. Bolder than those who have higher reputations to maintain, a recent writer to whom reference has heretofore been made has carried this claim to its extremist limit by alleging that all the ecumenical councils, including that at Nice, as well as the whole church from the beginning, have recognized papal infallibility as the only true Christian faith. It scarcely needs to be said that he is a Jesuit priest. He says this, quote, The First Council of Nice intended to give greater publicity to the condemnation of Arius was convoked by Pope Sylvester under the reign of Constantine the Great, who used his imperial authority to facilitate the meeting of the fathers. The sovereign pontiff presided by his three legates, one of whom was Osius, Bishop of Cordova. The other two were priests. Osius, whom Athanasius styles as, quote, the leader of the council, unquote, occupied the first place attended by his two companions. How great the deference here shown to the papal authority, since the mere reflection of it gave even simple priests the precedence over bishops, who on the present occasion were either Orientals or Greeks, and yet never objected to his conduct of the legates as implying an undue assumption of power. This fact alone suffices to show that the, quote, prerogatives of the Holy See were then recognized all over the Christian world, unquote. And quoting further, he says, No one, therefore, will be at all startled by the fact that, even previous to any measures taken by the councils, the legates, acting under instructions, condemned the blasphemous doctrines of Arius. The fathers were guided in their deliberations by these instructions, as well as by the symbol of faith prescribed by Sylvester and brought from Rome, together with a number of disciplinary regulations. At the close of the council, all the acts were sent to Rome for confirmation. Unquote. You see how bloated this assessment of this Jesuit priest is? That the Pope was too important to even show up at the council, so he sent his legates. O- only one was a bishop, the other two were priests, and they were the shadow of the Pope. And even through them, they cast such a shadow as to overthrow or overshine or to quench the light even from the other bishops on the council. You see how bloated this is? Trying to show that even the legates of the Pope are supreme. That's the assessment of a Jesuit priest. And it shouldn't surprise any of us knowing that the Jesuits are the ones who propound upon the world the infallibility of the Pope, and that he is, as it were, God on earth, and that the whole world should kneel at his feet and do as he says, without thinking, without caviling, without reasoning to himself, and that he should keep his conscience in check and just obey as a cadaver, as a stick in the hand of an old man, that the Pope, by divine right, has the right to rule every man, woman, and child on the planet, and that we should all be unthinking zombies and respond to him as though he were God on earth. They still bloat the Pope as some divine right vicar of Christ on the earth. And it starts right here with the Council of Nice. But how much did the Pope really have to do with what took place at the Council of Nice? The author continues, he says, when Sir Walter Scott wrote about the quote-unquote tangled web wove by those who, quote, practiced to deceive, unquote, He must have had in mind some such monstrous perversion of facts as is contained in this brief extract of this Jesuit priest. 
It would be difficult to find elsewhere so much misrepresentation upon important points of history in so brief a compass. And yet it is deliberately put forth and largely circulated in this country, the United States of America, as veritable history as one of the chief foundation stones upon which the superstructure of the papal edifice has been erected. We occasionally meet with individuals who so, who so frequently repeat romantic and improbable stories that they come at last to believe them true. And such would seem to be the only apology for those who give utterance to these unfounded and unsupported assertions. They might be left to indulge in their delusion, but for the uses they now make of them. Since, however, they base upon them the right of the papacy to confront the world and to command all human progress to cease, they themselves create the necessity for the discovery of the precise truth. Having by their vindictive assaults, <coughs> excuse me, having by their vindictive assaults upon Protestantism, invited the investigation, they will have no right to complain if, when the truth is discovered, their whole system of papal supremacy would topple and fall before it. This author supports his statements by references to no other of the Greek fathers but Sozomen. He, however, cites Athanasius to prove that Osius, or Hosius, as it was pronounced, was, quote, the leader of the Council of Nice, unquote, and the 18th and 29th canons of the Council to show that the supremacy and primacy of the Pope was formally acknowledged by it. Why should we not apply to the investigation of such matters as these the same rules of evidence by which we test the truth and falsehood of any other statements we find in history? Undoubtedly, he did not expect them to be subjected to so severe a test, but that does not release them uh, does not release from the responsibility of doing so who desire to ascertain the truth. Sozomen is supposed to have written his ecclesiastical history about the year 440 or 445 A.D., more than a hundred years after the Council of Nice. That of Socrates was written about the same time, probably a little later. Eusebius, who was a member of the Council of Nice, preceded both of them with his ecclesiastical history and, of course, wrote about many things of which he had personal knowledge. In his history, however, he does not speak of the proceedings of the council, but of the matters preceding it. All we learn from him about the council is, is found in his Life of Constantine. Theodoret's ecclesiastical history was designed as a continuation of those of Sozomen and Socrates, and must have been written a few years only before his death, which occurred about 458 A.D., these are the so-called Greek fathers from whom we must, uh, whom must be learned all that can now be known of the history of the Council of Nice whenever we turn aside from mere guesswork and speculation and enter into the, re the region of fact. Not one of these authors connects the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, in any direct form with the Arian controversy before the Council of Nice. Eusebius, who took part in it, does not, either in his history or the life of Constantine. Yet this mere omission on his part might not be held conclusive if the others had done so upon the strength of tradition only. He tells us that he, quote, thought proper to pass by, unquote, many things, quote, particularly the circumstances of the different heads of the churches who were from begin, who were from who from being shepherds of the reasonable flocks of Christ that did not govern in a legal or becoming manner were condemned by divine justice as unworthy of such a charge unquote. and also quote, the ambitious aspirings of many to to office 
and the injudicious and unlawful ordinations that took place, the divisions among the confessors themselves, the great schisms and the difficulties industriously fomented by the new members against the relics of the church, devising one innovation after another and unmercifully thrusting them into the midst of all these calamities, heaping up affliction upon affliction, unquote. He speaks here of the heads of the churches in the plural, which includes the idea of there, being, of there having been any such thing known in his day as the Church of Rome being the head and or the mistress of all the other churches. But as we must conclude from what he elsewhere said, that he intended to picture the melancholy condition of things existing at Rome in consequence of the alliance between Constantine and the Roman clergy. Heretofore, I've referred to it as the unholy alliance of Constantine and the clergy, which caused nothing but division and controversy, everyone struggling for power. It was all about temporalities. It had absolutely nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it just, well, it was such a problem that Constantine had to call a council. It says, But as we must conclude from what he elsewhere said, that he intended to picture the melancholy condition of things existing at Rome in consequence of the, I'll add the word, unholy alliance between Constantine and the Roman clergy, it is easy to see that he also included Rome when he spoke of, quote, the ambitious aspirings of many to office, unquote, and the, and the consequent, quote-unquote, divisions and, quote-unquote, innovations. Prudential reasons, therefore, may have restrained him from any special reference to the connection of the Bishop of Rome with the Arian controversy. However this may be, he is silent on that subject, and we have now no means of supplying the omission, if it is merely an omission, unless it can be gathered from what he may have left to be inferred, or from the other authors named, or be specially manufactured in support of some preconceived theory. So far from his having said anything justifying such an inference, he excludes any such idea entirely in his life of Constantine, where speaking, quote, of the people being thus in every place divided, unquote, and the prevalence of the, quote, bitterest disunion, unquote, he says that, quote, Constantine appeared to be the only one on earth capable of being God's minister, unquote, to provide, quote, the healing of these differences, unquote, without referring to the Bishop of Rome as having any agency or authority in the matter. In other words, the Roman clergy was in so much upheaval and infighting and chaos that at that point in history, it appeared that only Constantine could rise to the level of God's representative in the matter of the Arian heresy. And yet the Roman Catholic Church claims that it can establish its divine right to rid the world of heresy because of the actions taken by the Bishop of Rome during the Arian heresy. When the facts of history reveal that the Roman Church was in such great upheaval that the emperor had to step in and call a council. And you know he wasn't Christian. Certainly was not Roman Catholic. And that puts, contrary to what the previous Jesuit priest says, it puts the bishop of Rome in <laughs> very insignificant terms. And yet they claim that the Bishop of Rome presided over the Council of Nice, 
and everything that resulted from the Council of Nice establishes the papacy's divine right to rid the world of heresy. Isn't it interesting what a little true history can do to your perceptions of the Roman Catholic cult? Sozaman gives an account of the origin of the controversy between Arius and the Bishop of Alexandria and states the fact that the latter convened a council of African bishops within his own ecclesiastical jurisdiction and, quote, cast him, that is, Arius, out of the church, unquote, together with certain African presbyters and deacons who agreed with him. Arius, in defense, sought, quote, the favor of of the bishops of other churches, unquote, and, ad and addressed letters to them. The bishop of Alexandria also, quote, wrote to the bishops of every church, unquote, not to Rome specifically, where alone it would have been necessary to write if that had been the seat of the headship and primacy of the church universal. Numerous synods were held, Arius sent messengers to Paulinus, bishop of Tyre, and Eusebius Pamphilius, who presided over the church of Caesarea in Palestine, and to Patrophilus, bishop of uh, Scythopolis. And intelligence of these dissensions having reached Constantine the emperor, who had been a long time absent from Rome, was quote-unquote greatly troubled probably because he sincerely desired by this time that the cause of Christianity should not be injured by them, and probably also because he feared that these perpetual divisions among the Roman clergy and the, and the Christian clergy would weaken his hold upon the imperial throne at Rome. So Constantine's got a temporal reason to intervene, since all the quote-unquote bishops are at odds with one another. And notice in the reading of all this, no significance whatsoever is given to the Bishop of Rome. As a matter of fact, the Bishop of Rome is completely absent from this discussion. And yet, Rome still claims her justification for primacy because it presided over the Council of Nice and that it handled the Arian controversy. It says, he, accord, he accordingly, that is Constantine, accordingly went to work at once to employ his temporal authority, no mention of the Pope's temporal authority here, he's going to apply his temporal authority to heal the breach and quote-unquote rebuked the contestants, Arius and Alexander, as already stated. Sozaman does not give this letter of Constantine, but Eusebius does, and it shows very clearly that he acted in the matter wholly without reference to the Bishop of Rome. It, moreover, shows, too, that he had a just and intelligent appreciation of the great principle upon which Protestantism is based. For after characterizing the dispute between Arius and Alexander as upon truly insignificant questions, merely some trifling and foolish verbal differences, he points them to the example of the philosophers who, though they may differ as to the perfection of a principle, they are recalled to harmony of sentiment by the uniting power of their common doctrines, and counsels them not to let the circumstances which has led to a slight difference between them, since it affects not the general principles of truth, be allowed to prolong any division or schism among you, quote, for we are not all of this like-minded on every subject, nor is there such a thing as one disposition and judgment common to all alike, unquote. Do you see the Bishop of Rome, the universal arbiter of truth, having anything to do with the Arian heresy? And yet, once again, Rome asserts that this example of her handling of the Council of Nice and the Arian heresy as divine right justification to rid the world of heresy, to rid the world of Protestantism, what a hoax has been put upon God's people 
We'll be back tomorrow on Inquisition Update and more of the Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Thanks for tuning in.